But then when I give them the answers, then they're kind of more intrigued to just what I have to say. Okay. Like, oh, you really, you, you're living like this, or you do this, what else you do? I don't do nothing else but cut hair. And so I think a lot of times I'm just showing them that it's possible to live an honest life and make right. a good living without doing the things that TV might lead us to believe that you have to do to live a certain lifestyle. Mm -hmm. To our youth who feels like selling drugs is the answer, what advice do you give them? Man, <laughs> man, to be honest with you, I've never knocked somebody for what they have to do to, to survive, because mm -hmm. I've been there. Okay. I've never passed judgment on anybody. But we're, we're working tirelessly to create opportunities so y'all don't have to do it. And that's something that I put on my back. I'm not going to tell you to not sell drugs if I don't have an opportunity for you. Correct. So we're creating them opportunities. But like I said, I never pass judgment on somebody. They got to do what they got to do. As long as you're not, you know, out here just selling drugs to buy shoes and stuff like that, that's pointless. Because you got to remember, man, like when I ran the street, I'm from the 90s, the crack era, mm -hmm. where a lot of my friends' parents were out here strung out on drugs. So they were selling drugs to put food in the house. So it's just different. It's like, it's just different. But like I said, me personally, I've been there, so I would never sit and pass judgment on anyone. I understand, but my job is, if I truly understand, like I say I do, let's create some opportunities for them so they ain't got to do it. Do you, in a lot of ways, feel like you become a father figure to a lot of these young guys, you know, who, who kind of like, when they see Sean, they're like, okay, he's doing this, he's doing this. Do you feel like um uh, Absolutely, man. Like some some kids I'm more consistent in their lives than than they probably their own father. They know that they can come see me every Friday at five o'clock and I'm gonna be there. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've man, I it's funny, I've cut kids young that went through divorce, death of parents, and now I'm cutting their children. Mm -hmm. And so now nah, I definitely and I understand that. Like you have to understand that I, I definitely understand the position that I hold when it comes to that. Because I have a lot of, man, like, I have four bi biological kids, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of other right. children, yeah. like, that, that really come to me for certain things, man. And it's like, what do you do? You walk away from that? Nah, you got to embrace it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good feeling, that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good feeling, man, because that's how you live forever. People want to know how you live forever. You live, you live forever through other people. Because at the end of the day, man, if you... If you're not helping others, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. See, like, we get caught up in just trying to self-indulge on the things that we want. But if you're not helping others, what are you really doing? Because this is not really about us. I mean, it's like that from the beginning of the time. When you're a child, it's some, it, when you're a child someone else is taking care of you. Then when you have children, now you're automatically responsible for someone else. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's never really about us. Mm -hmm. But we, I think the fact that we make it about us causes us to stay in that hamster meal. Because the bottom line is, if you're not helping somebody else, what are you really doing? There goes that music again. Mm -hmm. So um, we're running short on time. Someone want to get in contact with you? How to go about doing that? Uh, man, you can you can go to, um, you can email me at da underscore lucky spot at yahoo.com. You can follow, please follow us on Instagram at the Lucky Spot Barbershop um, on Twitter at the Lucky Spot Barbershop and you can also like us on Facebook at the Lucky Spot Barbershop. Thank you, Sean, for coming on the show. Audience, you be encouraged. Thank you. Mm. Hey everybody, it's Dan Hayes, filmmaker at Freethink. I have a question for you. Did you know that 77%, a record high, of Americans think our country is divided? It certainly feels that way. It's like everywhere you look, there are stories that reinforce the divisions, the problems that we face as a country. At Freethink, we want to shift that focus. So we're launching a new series called Crossing the Divide. This series is going to tackle some of the most contentious issues of our time, but it's going to be told through the people who are working really hard to bring opposite sides together. We'll go to an Islamic mosque in the Bronx that has invited a Jewish congregation to worship under the same roof. You'll hear from a gay rights activist who's gone to thousands of homes of voters who are against gay marriage to do something pretty groundbreaking. Listen. And we'll head to Charlotte to see how a local barber and cop have teamed up to ease tensions and push for peace in their city. 
These are just a few of the stories that we're going to be covering in this series. These people have genuinely inspired our team and we cannot wait to share this series with you. Click the link to be the first to see Crossing the Divide. The Michael Brown thing, that changed how I looked at a lot of things. And I was a kid. I was a kid. And then, like, I watched these people destroy their neighborhood. I've never actually witnessed anything like that. Like, me and my wife, we watched that all the way up until about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Everybody in America wants a safe community. <laughs> my wife was more like, well, what are you going to do about it? I hear you talking about it, but what are you going to do? Am I going to sit on the sidelines? And I've never been a sideline person. The Black Lives Matter movement was born in 2013 after the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the shooting death of Trayvon Martin. Since then, the country has been rocked by videos of tragic shootings and protests reacting to those videos, cycling on the news and online. There are many perspectives on these emotionally charged events, and the distance between different activist groups can sometimes seem insurmountable. This is a story about Sean, aka Lucky Corbett, and his efforts to change the conversation between police and his community in Charlotte, North Carolina. To make money, Sean used to sell drugs. At that time, it was so much easier than working at McDonald's. And he made a lot more money. I had a baby at 17. While everybody else is buying prom tickets, I'm buying pampers and formula. So it was a job. We were putting food on the table. After multiple trips to prison, Sean wanted to change. Now, what I wanted to do, I didn't know. But I knew it wasn't sitting in no cell for most of my life. Ultimately, he decided to become a barber and open up a barber shop. Barbershop, if I can sum it up in one word, is family. Your barbershop represents that neighborhood. Anything that goes on in the community, it comes through the barbershop. Over the years, I've done so much bad in the neighborhood that I want to do a little bit of good. The shooting of Michael Brown made Sean reflect on his own son's ability to interact with law enforcement. At that time, my son was 18. That got my wheels to turning. Does he even know how to speak to an officer I had to ask myself, did I teach him right? The answer was no, because I didn't know the right way. So I said, what can I do to change this? Sean saw a problem, a disconnect between his community in Charlotte and the police. And it was complicated. There were racial tensions, poor educational system, mistrust on both sides. So he took a first step. Pretty much I reached out to the police department and was like, we need to do this. And so that's how we ended up with the Cops and Barbers Initiative. So Sean partners up with this guy, Gary McFadden, a homicide detective in Charlotte for 37 years, and they start building the team. The chief of police has asked me to be a part of a project that he thinks is going to be beneficial to the city. So I walk in, I'm in class A uniform, I look around the room, everyone's in class A uniform, and in walks this guy with his hat cocked sideways and tattoos on his neck and sits right next to me. He had been to prison. He was a convicted felon. This doesn't normally look like the guy that we partner with. Captain Rob Dance has been an advocate inside the police department to build more productive relationships between law enforcement and the community. And now he's in charge of training new police in Charlotte. I don't think that police can effectively police a community unless they understand who some of the people are that they're going to be policing. I think that we've missed that step. When I first met Captain Dance, man, um, I was like, yo, he really cares. And I told him, I said, um, from this point on, any community event that I ever do, you better be a part of it. And he agreed. It's been like, it, we've been rocking ever since. To ease racial tension in America, man, you gotta go straight at it, man. When I met Rob, one of the things that we discussed was we don't take the opportunity to realize that we are all human. My biggest thing is creating opportunities for children to see officers as people. And so we created a tutoring program. 
Every police recruit is going to tutor young kids in the community throughout their entire time here at the police academy. He put me in handcuffs, but I didn't get arrested. Do you think you were treated right? No, sir. Here's what I want to tell you. Are there dirty cops? Yes. How do we know they're dirty cops? We need people to tell us. You should file a complaint. So let me load this up for you. You're the police. You're the police. They job is really on the difficult side. Sometimes they put in positions to make a split-second decision. Are you going to shoot them? Unfortunately, we don't really hear about the split-second decisions that went right. It's our job to get in our communities and dictate what's going on. We can't put it all on them. And so we have to kind of meet them halfway. You have to realize your responsibility in your community. And I think that that is an absolute perfect example of what this program is all about. All right, man, here. Y'all gonna get older and y'all gonna, gonna be the big dogs in the community. And if y'all ain't putting in no work, it's never gonna change. It's just gonna be worse. Like, just remember that, it's gonna be worse. And then one day y'all gonna have kids and y'all gonna want the communities better for your kids. Cops and barbers do cadet training, tutoring, transparency programs, and mentorship, all in an effort to help people in their community better understand each other. But for Sean and Captain Dance, it's more personal than that. Here we go, load your weapon. Early on, we were introducing the program, and there was a young student. I was bumping people's elbows saying, who is this kid? Everything that he said, he meant, he was passionate. And I found out that night that it was Sean's son, Khalil. Khalil is now a cadet here in the police department. And although I can't guarantee that he will be hired, I can't imagine that we wouldn't bring someone like that on to the force. Seeing my dad going to jail and things of that nature, it changed him as a man and you see where he's at now and that's just kind of tell everybody that there's no bigger way to make a change than to actually be the change. Sean and Captain Dance are both working to see these challenges from a different vantage point. They know that Cops and Barbers isn't gonna solve this complex problem overnight, but taking this approach has been really helpful. One of the key things that I've learned since I've been doing Cops and Barbers is just like, man, you need more Rob dances. People that really care, but as a community, we have to be more willing and more receptive to these guys, and we have to work together. That's the key. You treat people differently when you know them, and I think that that's the key here for police to learn and understand people in the community. We can't keep it separate and expect things to change. At the end of the day, the way that I see it, it's up to us.